You know what it means when I hold one of these up, right? It means I finished another Wheel of Time book. So guys, let's talk about that storm. The wheel has turned, for better or worse, and it will keep on turning as lights die and force dim, storms call and skies break. The wheel is not hope and the wheel does not care. The wheel simply is, but so long as it turns, folk may hope, and each storm that rages must eventually die. As long as the wheel turns. I continue to wonder why you all assume that I am too dense to see what you find so obvious. Yes, this hardness will destroy me, I know. You all claim that I've grown too hard, that it will inevitably shatter and break as I continue on. But you assume that there needs to be something left of me to continue. I see it now. I will not live through this. And so I do not need to worry about what might happen to me after the last battle. I do not need to hold back. I don't need to salvage anything of this beaten up soul. The end is near. The wheel has grown its final rotation. The clock has lost its spring and the serpent heaves its final gasps. Hey, what's up wheelies and dark friends? Mike back again today to talk a little more Wheel of Time because guys, at this moment, I am 86% done with the Wheel of Time because I finished The Gathering Storm, book number 12 of Robert Jordan's fantasy epic, The Wheel of Time, and the first one to be completed by Brandon Sanderson. Now, you guys know by now that I'm a huge Brandon Sanderson fan, so I wasn't really too worried about that part. Uh, I do have some concerns that I'm going to address in this. Uh, even after reading this, I have some concerns about the way that Sanderson is approaching this. And I'm going to talk about these things in depth. If you guys do not know by now, I don't know why you would be watching book number 12 of a 15, or 14 book series. Uh, I can say 15 because I count New Spring. So uh, yeah, if you're this far into it, you know that there's going to be spoilers in this video. All my Wheel of Time reviews do have spoilers so if you uh, don't want to be spoiled on book number 12, again, I don't know why you're watching this, but I just want to give that little disclaimer like I always do. But uh, there is a lot to talk about. It was one of those books that, uh, you know, with what's going on around the world right now, I don't want to mention, you know, it who must not be named because apparently that'll get you in big trouble with the YouTube overlords. So I don't want to mention it. But uh, yeah, a lot of things have been thrust upon us like, you know, spending more time with our kids than we usually do and being kind of uh, locked in together. So that's kind of took away from a lot of my reading time and that kind of slowed my process down to where, you know, I usually wipe out a uh, Wheel of Time book in about a week. Yeah, and I know a lot of people consider that super like fast. Uh, but uh, what I usually do with a, with a Wheel of Time book is I'll sit down, I'll do like a hundred page bursts and, you know, I'm able to finish them in about a week. And wasn't the case with this one. This one took about 14 days uh, but you, like I said, it also was very back heavy, like most Brandon Sanderson stories are where, you know, it's, uh, it's build up, build up, build up, and then boom, you know, and Brandon Sanderson's one of the best closers in the business. And I think that that might be why I think he might be perfect for finishing this series, because I think Robert Jordan is the master of build up and Sanderson is like the master of closing. So now that he is here to close the end of the story, I think it might be a really good match. We're going to get into the nitty gritty here. Now I'm going to try not to make this as long as previous reviews, but uh, let's be real. It's probably going to happen because I it's one of those like last time where I thought, I don't think there's like a ton that happened. And then I looked at my notes that I made and I was over six pages. So that would actually make this longer than Knife of Dreams, which is crazy because I felt like much more happened in Knife of Dreams. I very much felt like this was a part one of two book and I actually part one of three. But uh, I'll get into the, the particulars of why I feel like that as I go along. Uh, okay, so let's just, uh, as we always do, I'll start with the prologue. I'll kind of talk about that because that's like our glimpse of what's going on around uh, not our main characters. And then I'll break it down by character 
as I usually do, the product, the, the prologue sees uh, folks around the world just kind of starting to uh, culminate, get ready to head to the last battle. Those are going to participate or those that are going to go take cover. Uh, Rand lets it be known that he still wants to meet the real daughter of the Nine, Boon, Nine, Nine Moons because, uh, yeah, the whole thing with Simarog and the last one, obviously that didn't happen. So he still wants to meet with the real daughter of the Nine Moons. Uh, Tylee thinks how they kind of need to cut the shit and start focusing on the last battle instead of uh, fighting each other. And that's before they are ambushed uh, by Trollocs. And uh, Mishima is actually, he takes an arrow through the throat. And that's kind of where their kind of thing uh, ends. And then you get to check in with the Forsaken. And, you know, I've gotten lots of flack on this channel for uh, for criticizing the Forsaken. That's not going to change. I still think that they're complete clowns. But I do feel like they are written in a better way here. But they still do some clown stuff in here. We'll talk about it. Uh, I wouldn't expect anything less at this point, but uh, Grandal, she is actually frustrated because she knows where all of the remaining Chosen are, except for Demondred. And, you know, you know, I didn't talk too much about it recently. I, I, I've had the whole idea, and I, I don't like to call it my theory because it's not my theory. I know it was out there years before I even picked up these books that, uh, that Majram Tame was Demondred. I'm still sticking by that. I feel like it's been kind of loosely confirmed, but not actually confirmed. Everything to, like... Uh, him, what colors of clothes he's wearing and, and the, the, the kind of things he says. But still, I don't think it's been completely confirmed yet. If I miss that, I'm sure I'm going to get blasted in the comments, and that's fine. That's fine. I, I expect at this point I'm going to get blasted in the comments because uh, basically I get a, I can't believe you didn't did this, or how did you not catch that? Every one of these, no, it, just, it happens. It happens. Uh, I, I'm not a historian. I miss things sometimes. I'm human. It happens. So if I've actually missed that, okay, but I don't think I have. But uh, Masana insists that they go rescue Simrog, who actually was caught by Rand and his people. And Moradin says, you know, we ain't got time for that shit. Uh, you guys, uh, basically he says she deserves what she got for attacking Rand after he told her not to, that Rand was his. He lets him know once again, uh, they are able, they are, yo, go kill Matt, go kill Perrin, but Rand is mine. You know, so that's kind of where they stay right now. But again, nothing goes the way that the Forsaken plan to. Uh, then we got, I mean, you know, real quick while I get into my first real characters here, uh, I do want to talk about what, Rodel Iteralde. Iteralde? Uh, I'm sure I, I say that incorrectly. Uh, but uh, I want to talk about him first because I feel like I said in my wish list that I felt like he was going to be a bigger character. He is a little bit bigger, but he's still a very, very tertiary character at this, at this point. I'm sure he does some stuff or else fans wouldn't be so high on him as they are. But uh, again, it shows he seems to be the only one who understands how to fight the Shan Chan because uh, he's, uh, he's got plans for they've got a, uh, an invasion of like 150,000 uh, coming towards Eridomon, and he's got like a plan here. Uh, basically, just got them hidden in the street. It's like it might be something from Vikings where they had the thing in Vikings where they like hid underneath the city and so they busted the doors and then they came out from them. I don't know if that's exactly what it was, but that's kind of what I was imagining while I was doing it. And, oh gosh, uh, I forgot something in the prologue. There was something else in the prologue. Uh, that the most interesting part of the prologue, in my opinion, uh, you got a Masima point of view, and which where he thinks about how he claims that the dragon actually commanded him to kill Perrin. So interesting, interesting there. And I'm thinking, okay, cool. I, I'm glad we're gonna get some kind of a, you know, we're gonna follow the storyline. Nope. Uh, he's met by Fayil. Uh, he's shot by arrows, and then Fayil comes up and stabs him in the heart. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was unexpected. And it's like, wow, we've really been going with this since the Great Hunt, and that's really how it ended. And it makes me wonder. This is my first instance with Sanderson, where I'm like, is this maybe something he didn't have too much notes on? He's like, mm, I'm not gonna do anything with that. Let's just go ahead and end it. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. These are things that I'm afraid to look up right now. I'm sure these questions have answers, but I'm afraid to look them up. I'm so close to the end. I had something new spoiled for me today, by the way, and I don't want to talk about it. But uh, everybody's been really great about not spoiling stuff, especially the big bombshell that happens later in this book, which I'll get into. But uh, yeah, uh, I was I was stunned. I was stunned. I really didn't think that they were just going to do it like that. But uh, yeah, he's done. He's done. Like I said, maybe Jordan didn't have a ton of notes for that, or Sanderson just decided, mm, we ain't got time for this. Uh, what else with, uh, back to Iteralda. Uh Him and his people, after the battle, they uh, they take uh, refuge at a steading, and, and, and they, they won this fight, but, uh, you know, he lost like half of his forces, and he's thinking to himself, he knows that they cannot win, but he's hoping, you know, that what they're doing can inspire future generations to, uh, you know, how to fight the Sean Chan or whatever. So it's just kind of like a, a moral victory, really, at this point, even though, you know, 
he's he's run out of he's run out of soldiers here and that's when rand comes up shows up and speaks to him and says you know hey uh i'll take care of this i'll get eridoman under control i'm going to try to negotiate a truce with the shan shan i want to make you a deal i'll offer you 100 men to can channel so 100 ashaman if you will head to the borderlands and Rodell agrees so that's pretty much what he does in this he is actually at the borderlands a little bit later but uh yeah that's that's pretty much it there's not a ton that happens with him in this book but i do feel like again this is the setting the chessboard so to speak episode of this story and i'm stunned i'm talking about it so early in this one but i'm going to talk about matt next because i don't think a lot happens with matt and the thing that i've heard a lot is that with this first book that sanderson did apparently he claims that he um he had a hard time writing Matt. And I said I can understand that. I, I think that's probably a very difficult character to write. And when I read this, I didn't notice a ton of difference. In fact, I'll say that about the whole thing. If someone had not told me it was someone besides Robert Jordan writing this, I would I would have believed it. I, I mean, I it, it's not just because he mentions that they fold their arms under their breasts or anything like that, or that they smooth their skirts. I feel like that's a good, it's a good old tip of the hat. But uh, I feel like Sanderson, he arranged his writing style just right to feel like nothing's changed. And I, I seriously feel like if, if someone going in this blind has no idea and just has these 15 books without an author name on it, I don't think they'd be able to tell. You know, maybe you're telling me I'm crazy right now. Maybe it's because I was looking for it. I, I didn't even notice. And I didn't notice the huge difference in Matt that everyone else claims to know. I think his storyline is just kind of meh in this one. And that might just be because I'm sour because it's like, hey, yo, last book, I think, hey, we're going to get Moraine. And then we spend a whole book. And I realized this before I started. Actually, while I was doing my wish list episode, I said, I know that the next book's called Towers of Midnight. And I figured that's going to be the Moraine book. So uh, I, I knew I had a whole other book before I got to that. But I don't know if that kind of shined negatively on Matt's story in this one. Because, again, I just think it's just okay. It's kind of weird. It's kind of, you know, some freaking horror show stuff. But uh, anyway, let's talk about it. So he's he's griping with some of his men in the red hand. Basically griping about women, griping about marriage. Uh, just wants to, you know, drink and party and go play some dice or whatever. You know, but he can't stop thinking about Tuan the whole time. So there's that, right? Uh, but uh, they arrive at this town called Hinderstep. Hinderstep? 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 And they're told that they have to leave by nightfall. Uh, long story short, that doesn't happen. Yeah, they're actually there after nightfall. And then they are just like randomly attacked by all the townsfolk. And they're forced to defend, them, defend themselves and actually like kill a number of them before they're actually able to get away to safety or whatever. Uh, but they return uh, the next morning at sunrise just to kind of find out what really happened. And they see that everything is back to normal. In fact, several of the townsfolk that they actually killed or walking around just fine. So I'm like, wow, what is this? Uh, there was also something where, like they, they took like these two uh, uh, bar matrons, I think they were bar matrons. They took them and they just like disappeared uh, when you know when the sun came up. And yeah, yeah, you see them in the town or whatever. So they uh, they talk to town leadership and he tells them it's kind of like a Groundhog Day situation where you know when the when the sun goes down they you know they they go, they go mad at night and then they wake up in the next morning and they don't really remember very much and it's like nothing ever happened. So uh, yeah, that's a really really interesting turn of events and i don't know if that has anything to do with uh god what was was it crossroads or twilight where they find the parents group they find a town that has like the ghosts or whatever i don't know i i don't know i this this storyline i mean i'm just assuming it has something to do with you know the end times coming uh the dark ones touch or whatever but i i don't know this one's really really weird so if i missed that okay uh, it's it's an interesting thing but i don't really have an answer about what it was all about uh, but uh, Matt does find out that the hit has been put out on him and Perrin. And they tell him that there's a woman a town away that's, uh, you know, giving away, you know, pictures of their likeness because she's looking for them. And uh, this is when they visit Viren. And Viren visits his camp with some of the papers and she thinks that, uh, they think that she's the one that obviously is handing around his likeness uh, of Perrin and Matt and, and, and to two other dark friends. And that she has the ability to travel, which she admits, yes, on both of these. And she tells Matt she has, uh, basically she has a, 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 an offer to give him. That she had every intention to go into Tarvalin, but she feels like maybe it was his Tervirin pull that kept leading her to Matt. 
and she tells him that Rand has cleansed Sidene, which Matt's just like, what? How? What? Holy hell. Right? And I figure you forget that, you know, three books later, there's still people who don't know about this. But uh, uh, it's it's kind of a nice way to kind of end it where, you know, everybody's complaining about Crossroads. It was just everybody's reaction to that. So it is kind of cool that they're still just kind of talking about it. At least I think it was kind of neat. A couple books later, they're still talking about it. Uh, but uh, she offers him a sealed letter and tells him that she will travel him and his band to Camelot, which save them a lot of time. She will travel them there, uh, but uh, she has to he has to wait there for 10 days and open the letter and do whatever it is that she's telling him to do. And he says, no, I ain't got time for that. No way. Uh, so he counters with saying, how about I wait 30 days, I read your letter, and then I just decide on my own what I'm going to do. And she reluctantly agrees. Uh, again, I'm not seeing a huge difference in Matt's character that everyone said that I would just notice like crazy. Like I said, it might just be because this wasn't the storyline I wanted. I wanted Matt and Tom and, and Noel going to uh, going to the Tower of Genji and getting my girl because I, I need my Moraine back. But uh, yeah, this didn't really do a ton for me. And uh, I, I'm glad it was just... If this is the book where they claim that he didn't know how to write Matt, it's cool that there are only like three or four chapters, right? And I'm never going to say I'm okay with less Matt. But this, this storyline was just like, oh, whatever to me. Uh, if it has a greater purpose, which I'm sure that it does, unless it's something that I'm already missing, uh, okay, cool. I'm sure it has a point eventually. In other words, unless it's just showing how the whole world's going mad, right? That's the only other thing I can think of. Uh, another one I'll talk about briefly is Avienda. And briefly, because remember last review, I might have been the wish list where I said, hey, remember when Swan Shanche was an awesome character and you couldn't wait to read her? Same with Avienda. Just kind of don't care at this point. Uh, I've said routinely that I feel like the Rand and Min relationship is great. You guys know how I feel about uh, Elaine, but I like the Avienda. I just don't like anything. She, she has, feels like she hasn't done anything since like freaking Fires of Heaven. I don't know. It just feels like nothing. And I'm just, I'm not interested enough in the Wise Ones to really put any stock into the storyline. It just has her being punished by the Wise Ones. They're not telling her why. Uh, later on, she's visited by men, and it's real awkward between those two, obviously. And that's something I like. I, I didn't like this whole idea of like, oh, yeah, they're best of friends. No, no, just Avienda and Elaine are super close. Men is still kind of like, eh, I don't really know. Uh, so I'm glad that there was some awkwardness between the two. But she asks her why she's being punished, and Avienda is just pissed because she don't even know. So she decides she's going to go find out. And she tells the wise ones, look, uh, I'm done with this bullshit, and it ends. I'm out. I'm out. And they tell her, well, it's about freaking time. Because this was all part of the test. You had to declare yourself an equal with us to be raised to wise one status. Okay. Uh, so they order her to go to Ruidian and uh, enter the stone columns, you know, to, to become a wise one. Again, I hope this is going somewhere. Because I said last book, I felt like they just had her leave Elaine for whatever reason. Reasons. That's it. Uh, hey, about Elaine. Zero chapters in this book. So uh, that was a nice relief for sure. And you know what? Even the storylines that I'm not crazy about this one, they never ever reached the low, low, low floor that Elaine's chapters did in the previous five books. So uh, there's that. So that is definitely a plus for me. So guys, sorry. You don't get to hear me complain about Elaine for 10 minutes. Uh, I'll save that for Egwene. Let's talk about Tuan. Tuan. Now she returns to Ibudar, and she makes Beslan bend the knee. You know he's in control now that uh, Thailand had her head ripped off, and um, yeah, uh, he is now elevated to the high blood or whatever. So okay, whatever. I'm uh, not real crazy, crazy interested about the politics in Ibudar, but uh, I'm glad they aren't just kind of like dropping it or or taking Tuan off camera. You know, I feel like she's an important enough character now that. We need to know what's going on with her, especially since she's pretty much in control now, right? Uh, there's Tylee, who seems to have lived through that little ambush in the prologue. Uh, she arrives and tells of the Trollic attack and that maybe, you know, we should focus on making alliances instead of pissing off the dragon. And she says, okay, and she agrees to meet with Rand. And uh, she holds off declaring herself Empress. I thought this was a really neat idea. She holds off on naming herself Empress because she says she has to meet with Brand as an equal. And if she declares herself Empress, she can't do that. So I thought that was a really neat idea, even though she's like shocked how young he looks uh, when he comes up. And I was like, it's when you have to remind yourself 
that even though we're in, you know, a couple million words in here, at least it feels like, I don't know about that accuracy there, uh, that it's really only been like, what, two years since Eye of the World? And these were teenagers when we started. They're probably still teenagers or 20 at tops. So yeah, they're going to look really, really young still. Even though Rand's got the weight of the world on his shoulders, and I'm sure that'll make you age a little faster. But uh, she meets with him and he uh, he basically says, look, can we squash this? Because I don't have time to worry about you guys right now. I need to be focusing on the last battle. Uh, I got to worry about the last battle. Then we can resume. You, you know, after after the last battle, you guys can go back to being dicks to the whole land. You know, because uh, I'll be dead. You know, I'm not even worried about it after that. Uh, but she counters with that. Okay, how about you unite the lands under the Sanshan banner? And he just kind of scoffs and says some nonsense. And she's just like appalled that anyone would dare, dare like interrupt her. And she decides, you know what? This guy's got some big old dragon-sized balls, don't he? Uh, but uh, she feels like she's losing control a little bit of the negotiations. So she just kind of brings up Matt and she insults him. She insults Matt and Rand and Nynaeve. They're ready to throw hands over this. And not only is Tuan surprised, yours truly is shocked here because Nynaeve. Nynaeve is standing up for Matt's honor. Holy hell how much I love this woman at this point. This is great. This is great. I think it's one of those kind of things where if you have like a, a younger sibling and you're allowed to bust her chops and you're allowed to bust on them all the time and, and insult them and say all these disparaging things, but when someone else does it, you're like, uh-uh, uh-uh. I, I almost feel like it's kind of like that, almost like a protecting a little brother for her. Uh, so that was unexpected, you know, because I feel like that one of the things I complained about in earlier reviews about Nynaeve is that, you know, especially after the whole like rescuing thing, which they actually resolved in Crown of Swords uh, about uh, him rescuing them and the Mac, I'm like, he didn't do nothing. And I always felt like that kind of drove a wedge between her and Matt. But uh, to here, it feels like it's come full circle here. And, and they're, you know, they're they're the buds from uh, Two Rivers again. At least that's that's just, maybe I'm, I'm hoping for things like that. You know, I don't feel like Nynaeve was ever like one of their buds or anything like that. I felt like it was those three and Egwene were like the buds in Two Rivers. And Nynaeve was just kind of, what, the, uh, the, the wisdom. And she was always, you know ready to put people over her knee, whatever. But I feel like she's got, like, almost kind of overprotective at Matt at this point. And, 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 I, and I'm sure she feels that way towards Rand, too, even if she she's had such a character arc in this. You know, I, I don't feel like we're going to hear about these things. But uh, the things that happen with her and Rand in this book, I'll get into uh, a little bit later because there's a lot to talk about before we get there. Uh, where was I? Uh, so she's actually kind of surprised about that. And too, one wonders if maybe she just really underestimated Matt, you know, because she said after she saw him, you know, with his men, with the red hand, she was surprised at how much they, you know, they respected him. They were loyal to him. And, you know, maybe she misjudged him. And this just kind of doubles down more on that. She definitely misjudged him for how loyal people are to him. But uh, Rand starts to use some of his uh, newfound power, which I'll talk about when I talk about Rand. But uh, when I get to his part in the book, I just I don't want to get ahead of myself here. But he tells her, look, it is time to end this and let's sign a treaty. And she starts to feel like this is something that she wants to do, even though she doesn't want to do it. Uh, but she refuses at the last moment. And she demands that he bow in front of her because, you know, there's that Sean Chan prophecy. I think it says something like the, the dragon reborn will bow before the crystal throne or something. Don't quote me on that. That's just kind of... I didn't write it down. That's just something I'm going off of a memory there. And there's so many prophecies. I probably forgot about it at this point. Uh, but Rand just, you know, just... And just walks away without a word. So Tuan, go ahead. And she names herself Empress and says to prepare the invasion of the White Tower. Dum, dum, dum. <sighs> Who else can we talk about for the big ones? How about my dude Perrin? Because I said I felt like when Sanderson takes over that maybe he was going to have something for Perrin to do. Mm, not the case in this book. Uh, because Perrin is back to doing nothing. So remember when I said I thought that Perrin would be back to normal after he rescued Fayo? Nah, bro. Nah, he's more emo than ever. Thinking about how things are, are worse now than they've ever been or whatever. Uh, he decides, I think all he really does in this is he decides he's going to embrace using the wolf dreams again. Uh, he goes into the wolf dreams. He asks Hopper to teach him control. And Hopper's like, nah. And really at this point, I'm like, Hopper's just kind of a dick. Because I think like the last three times parents asked him for help on something, he's just kind of refused. So get lost, Hopper. Take a hike. Uh, stay dead. 
but Fayol, she accuses him of uh, sleeping with Berylaine. Uh, of course, he refuses uh, while she was captive and basically uh, is implying, you know, that, that something might have happened with her. And I feel like she's just deflecting, for sure. And at least that's how he feels. And he just says, look, I, I don't care what you did while you were captive, what you had to do, and I don't want to know. And I think about it in my position, I wouldn't want to know either, you know. My wife had to sleep her way to get away or she was raped or I wouldn't even want to know. You know, if she wanted to talk about these things, sure, I'm going to listen. But I wouldn't even want to know. If you want to keep these things to yourself, uh, keep these things to yourself. I think she has like some kind of like funeral for uh, for Roland <laughs> since uh, since her husband like hammer, hammer timed them. Uh, I, I don't know. I, the parent file stuff... I, I get, I, I've gotten some, uh, some some comments about this. Look, I don't dislike Fayo. I think she is an incredibly strong character. I really do. I don't like what Perrin turns into since Fayo came to the story. So if it seems like that's what I'm always going back to, that's just where I am. Because I don't feel like anything that they're doing. Uh, last two books, I felt like was the most Perrin stuff I've gotten worth a damn since Shadow Rising. And this one's just back to slog era Perrin, where it's just not really do anything uh all he's really there is to reintroduce tam to this story and that's that's a good thing because it has a really good payoff but tam does tell him that uh most of the men have decided to follow him instead of going back to the two rivers so uh that'll come in to play a little bit later um who do i got left before the big two here <sighs> let's talk about gawain Am I saying Gawain right? I say Gawain. I when I first read it, I was thinking Gawain. And then I thought, no, Gawain and a Gawain. That, 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 he wouldn't be hooking these two up. And their names rhyme. So I switched it to, to Gawain. Uh, again, guys, I don't listen to the audiobook. So how I read it, that's how I'm going to say it. If I'm saying it wrong, just cover your ears and be like, ah. Yeah. Uh, so he laments killing Hammer. Uh, Hammer was the guy that, that was the, what the, I guess he was the instructor or whatever. And he was the guy that actually got killed in the White Tower coup. And uh, this is where Gawain starts thinking about how he picked the wrong side. Even though even though these people, are, these younglings are like, oh, you should be a Blade Master because you you know, you know you got the hair marked blade. You're the Blade Master. You defeat a Blade Master. So you should be a Blade Master. And, you know, just stroking. And, 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 and Sanderson spends a lot of time. Sanderson, Jordan. S Sander, Don. I, 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 Janderson. Yeah, jo Jordan. Whatever. There's probably a <laughs> Jordanson. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to do that. Uh, the author spends a lot of time establishing, yo, Gawain really kicked some ass with a sword. Uh, I don't care that Matt, Matt whooped him and Galad's ass with a broomstick. Uh, he, he's really, really awesome with a, store, with a sword. I, I want to get that across here because it's going to be important, right? Uh, so, yeah, he learns that Egwene has, uh, has been captured. And this is when he knows, yo, look, I fucked up. I picked the wrong side. I should have never sided with Elida. I should be with Egwene. I should be with my sister. I should be on their side of this. So once he learns she's been captured, he decides it's time to bail. And he heads to the rebel side of the Aes Sedai. Uh, when he's there, he meets with Swan. And uh, Swan, and uh, he's looking for uh, Gareth Bryn to, to try to see if it, he will help him. Uh, go get her from the White Tower. And you know, Swan's like, she doesn't want to be rescued. And he's like, whatever, we ain't got time. And it's like a lot of things where every time Gawain shows up, he's a little hothead and he'll just start, he'll, basically he'll just start fights. He just seems like he just starts fights. Um, I don't really know uh, really much. I, I know that this character is hated and I don't really see why. Uh, I'll talk about it more in a minute. Um, I just feel like there's way more hateable characters in this. Uh, but anyhow, uh, but uh, Swan does convince Gareth Bren to help them out and go rescue her, but he insists on two things. The first being that he is bonded as her warder. And this is the first time that I remember, oh yeah, Jordan was kind of teasing, like these two were in love or something, I think, in Fires of Heaven or Lord of Chaos or something. I can't remember back that far ago. Uh, I forgot all about that. And, and then after the whole event, he does say like, oh, you got to marry me, but you know, after you guys figure all this thing out. So, uh, okay, cool. They are a couple now, just like most Jordan romances, you two have to be together because I said so, right? So take that for what it's worth. Uh, it wasn't exactly a, a romance or a love story that I was just longing to know the resolution to, obviously, because I forgot about it. Uh, but then you have the whole rescue mission, and, and Bryn kills this assassin, and the Sanchan assassin, but he takes like a tiny little nick, and uh, Swan remembers a viewing that men had, I believe, back in Fires of Heaven. 
I'm not I'm not sure and I don't even really remember what the actual viewing was because it kind of reminds you of this that basically uh, that 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 Schwann and Bren had to stay together uh, as close to each other as possible because if they don't he was gonna die or they both were going to die and so she decides she's gonna heal him and realize that the assassin had poisoned him so there uh, what I keep saying you know a lot of people told me look men's viewings aren't wrong we may be interpreting them wrong but they always come true. You can't change them or whatever. But Min herself even says in this book that, oh, well, well the pattern unravels and my viewings might not come true. So I feel like they're trying to wiggle their way out of that one. I don't know. I might be interpreting that wrong. That's just kind of how I read it. But uh, okay, cool. So there's another Min viewing. I'm looking forward to when I'm done with this series is looking up all of Min's viewings and then trying to see if I actually remember them happening in the book. Because a lot of the time they're just they're basically riddles or poetry and you have to actually really de decipher them and I suck at riddles guys uh, <laughs> going all the way back to reading The Hobbit uh, yeah I suck at riddles I suck bad at riddles and you think about uh, Blaine the Mono in, in uh, Stephen King's was it The Wastelands or was it uh, Wizard and Glass I don't remember but it had a whole thing with uh, with riddles and I just realized I'm terrible at riddles so I'm totally derailing now uh, but I'll talk more in detail about the whole fight in the tower when I get to Egwene stuff but basically, once it's all over, Gawain asks to speak to Egwene, and she just kind of blows him off. And I'll talk about that more. She basically says, like, look, we can't have a relationship as long as you aren't acknowledging me as the Amarlin or whatever. So, oh, Egwene, I'm going to get to it, trust me. Uh, <laughs> but again, I'm still just trying to figure the Gawain hate out. I don't know if people are hating him at this point or if it's something he hasn't done yet. Like I said, please don't tell me if I don't know yet. Um... I have to assume, because I don't feel like he did anything in this that, if you think he's worthless, okay. There's lots of worthless characters in this story, I think, or forgettable characters. But uh, to, to, to generate the hate where people were saying they hate, that, oh, you you, get, you hate Elaine? What about Gawain? And I'm just like, how are they comparable besides being related? I don't even understand. So uh, I'm imagining that there's something that is yet to come. And uh, yeah, if I could make it through the next two books without having that spoiled, That'd be great. That would be great. So guys, this is the part of the video where I have to interrupt with a little change and explain why. Uh, when I did my Knife of Dreams review, uh, it was like an hour and 13 minutes and I edited down parts as I was rambling to get it down to like 58 minutes. And I had a lot of people be like, oh, don't do that. We wanna hear all the stuff you have to say or whatever. So I decided what I have to do with these Wheel of Time videos because they're just getting so overly long and it's just it's murdering my algorithm is that uh i'm gonna have to start cutting some of these longer ones into two parts so um don't think don't look at this as oh you're just trying to get more clicks or something like that i've told you guys a million times that's not what it's about for me it's about with me is having conversation with you guys so i just want to let you know that's why i'm breaking this into two parts they're both available i'm not putting them out different days or anything like that you can watch part two immediately when you finish this i'm uploading them both at the same time so it's not a big deal there it really is just uh trying to keep these a little more tidy because the people are telling me they don't want me to cut anything out and uh, the amount of stuff that i had to say about Egwene and rand and just basically my overall thoughts for this just pushed this well over an hour and i just i want to make sure that i'm not shortchanging anybody who wants to hear me talk about some stuff that i might not think is a big deal but they say they would like to have heard my opinions on that so that's why i decided to do it that way so if you want to talk about all the characters or anything in this book you want to talk about hit me in the comments or whatever or write and hit me in, in part two if you want to talk about any of these particular storylines that i've talked about this one yeah go ahead and throw them in the comments here i want to talk about that and but again talk about it either of the videos you want to talk about any of the characters or anything that happened in the book please feel free just don't feel like you got to wait till you watch part two to comment so this one has no comments and that one has you know a hundred or something so um uh thanks guys for uh for for listening to part one and understanding why i'm actually breaking this into two parts and i'm trying to do new things just make sure that i can get you guys uh on board with them and understand that this is not like a uh a cash grab or anything like that because <laughs> If you guys knew the amount of money I made on here, you would not think that at all. Uh, anyhow, uh, so I will catch you guys on part two where I'm going to be talking about the whole uh, assault on the White Tower and uh, the, the, the reunification. Yeah, and I'm going to be talking about everyone's favorite topic of mine, Equine. So uh, uh, that and uh, all the events that happened with Caswain and Ran and Tam and all those 
good, good, good little juicy tidbits there. So uh, flip on over there, guys. I will catch you there.